Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ellie Ann Glazer. I'm a writer, radio producer, and author of Get Real, How to See Through the Hype, Spin, and Lies of Modern Life. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here today for this RSA Thursday event. Before I begin, can I ask you to turn your mobile phones off? They are arguably responsible for this whole post-truth mess in the first place. Um, we're filming today and also live streaming on the web, so a very big welcome to those of you who are joining us online. And a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Truth if you'd like to join in on Twitter. So Matthew Dancona writes a weekly column for The Guardian, and he's a regular contributor to the Evening Standard, The New York Times, and GQ. Um, he was the Spectator editor and Sunday Telegraph's um, political columnist and the de deputy editor for many years. And he's also a visiting research fellow at Queen Mary University of London and author of several books, including In It Together, The Inside Story of the Coalition. And he joins us today to discuss the new post-truth era and how to fight back. And clearly, this is an urgent issue. We've seen you know, the rise of social media, including Twitter, I have to say. Uh, the Brexit campaign and the misinformation there, um, Trump's election. And interestingly, accusations of fake news often come from uh, Trump's uh, tweets. Um, so what's going on? Um, Matthew's written an, an admirably polemical but also nuanced book, um, which I hope um, will be able to enlighten us. So please join me in um, handing over to Matthew. Well, uh, thank you very much, and it's, it's particularly nice uh, to see you all here, and also to be introduced by Anne, who's a, a real pioneer in this field. And uh, I, um, it may be an odd thing for someone who's promoting a book to say, but go and buy hers, because it's really good. <laughs> uh, uh, I've got, there's so many things one could say about this, so I shall, I, shall, I shall kick things off, and then we can get into a debate, because I think that's always the best way to approach something like this. The, the first thing, uh, this, post, this whole post-truth business is, the first question people tend to ask is, surely this is nothing new? And um, they say, you know, haven't human beings uh, been lying to each other since they could communicate? What about Watergate? What about Bill Clinton's impeachment? What about the Iraq dossiers? What about spin? And for those who are minded to go back a bit further, what about Machiavelli's advice to the prince to be a great pretender and dissembler? In other words, haven't we been, this is all part of human um, existence and communication uh, since language began. And I say yes to all of that. I mean, mendacity is as old as language itself. A falsehood has always been a feature of the human condition. And you can tell a politician is lying because, well, you can fill in, you know, the rest of the joke. But post-truth is something else and something new, in my view. And the novelty is not to be found in the lies but in our response to those lies. It's about us, not them, if you want to put it another way. And now, as many of you may know, in 2016, Oxford Dictionary selected post-truth as its word of the year, defining it as, I'm quoting, circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And I think that gets right to the heart of the matter. Um, let's look at some examples first of all. If you take last year's uh, Brexit referendum, please take it away. Um, um, Aaron Banks, whom you might know, was one of the uh, big uh, spenders in that campaign, but also a backer of UKIP for many years. A uh, very sharp-witted businessman. Um, he bankrolled the, the Leave.EU campaign, which was not the official campaign, but was very important, I think, to the outcome. And Banks was uh, what everyone thinks of him, correct in his analysis of the outcome. He said, and I'm quoting again, the Remain campaign featured fact, 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 fact. It just doesn't work. You've got to connect with people emotionally. Now, that rings horribly true to me because um, as a Remainer, um, you know, we were pressing for Britain's continued EU membership, but we were doing so by bombarding the public with statistics. Leaving would cost 950,000 UK jobs. The average wage would fall by 38 pounds a week. Each family would pay an average of 350 pounds more on basic goods. Six, six million pounds invested by the EU countries in the EU would be at risk. The cost of living would be 4,300 pounds per, per household more, and so on and so on and so on. It was exhausting statistical overload. And it became easy to caricature this torrent of indigestible data as no more than a series of arbitrary claims. Um, 
And what they are, the Brexiteers understood was the need for simplicity and emotional resonance. Uh, they, had, they were looking for a narrative that would give visceral meaning to a decision that might otherwise appear terribly technical and jurisprudential and abstract. And Dominic Cummings, who was the campaign director of the official campaign, Vote Leave, argued at the time that the case for departing the EU had to be clear and to cleave to the specific grievances of the public. So while there were people in the campaign saying that the, the, the slogan should be go global, uh, which might be intellectually defensible, Cummings understood that it wouldn't win votes. Um, and he had done earlier research on Britain's potential membership of the Euro when that was a live issue, that had revealed the potential traction of a pledge to take back control, and he was proved right. Um, meanwhile, after considering a run at the presidency for decades, Donald Trump intuited a, th a similar shift in popular behavior. I mean, let's face it, he was never a sympathetic candidate. <laughs> but uh, the, the opinion polls show that the American people were perfectly aware of his character flaws. It's one of the most interesting aspects of all this. Um, what, what, what happened, I think, is he communicated what I would call a kind of brutal empathy to them. Um, rooted not in statistics or empiricism or information, but in a kind of uninhibited talent for rage and impatience and attribution of blame. So when people asserted, as they often did, that he was plain speaking, they didn't mean, as they might have in the past, that he was speaking the truth. I think what they meant in 2016 when they said that of Trump was, this candidate is different somehow, and he might just address my anxieties and hopes, which is a completely different proposition. So when Kellyanne Conway, uh, the senior aide to the president uh, recently elected, spoke of, famously of alternative facts, she was capturing perfectly, if inadvertently, this new epistemology. Um, in the post-truth era, what used to be called reality was becoming fungible. Um, the point is not to determine the truth by a process of rational evaluation, assessment and conclusion, the old Enlightenment model. You just choose your own reality as if from a buffet to suit your emotional needs. And I don't think it's, conspir uh, it's a, uh, uh, in any way a coincidence, we can talk about this more in the discussion perhaps, that there's been a resurgence of conspiracy theories of pseudoscience, anti-vaccination, and uh, most appallingly of Holocaust denial. Now, how has this come about, this change? Well, the social basis of post-truth, I think, is the collapse of trust in traditional institutions. Um, all else, there are many factors, but all else flows from this single poisonous source. Um, the financial crisis of 2008, I think, still continues to reverberate around the world. It took the global economy to the brink of meltdown. It was only averted by eye-watering the huge state bailouts for the very banks that were responsible for the collapse. Uh, in Britain, just to take one example, this was followed very quickly by the humiliation of the political class in the 2009 parliamentary expense scandal revealed by the, the Daily Telegraph. Um, meanwhile, there were scandals in show business, especially the monstrous sexual crimes of Jimmy Savile, which dragged the BBC and other in broadcasting institutions through the mire. Print journalism had its own uh, experience through the hacking experience, the, the hacking controversy, no less of a disaster, which forced the closure of the News of the World, the resignation of its former editor, Andy Coulson, from, as number 10's director of communications, a huge job, and then Lord Leveson's sweeping inquiry of 2011 to 12 into the conduct of the press. That's just the British example. So in other, other words, we live in an age of institutional fragility. Um, a society's institutions act, or at least used to act, as, the, as kind of the guardrails. They were the bodies that incarnated its values and its continuities. Um, to shine a bright light on their failures, decadence, and outright collapse, as has happened, is intrinsically unsettling, but that's not all. What's happened is that post-truth has flourished in this context. It's as if the firewalls and antibodies, if you like, uh, to, to mix metaphors, have of, of, of our system have, have weakened. And when the putative guarantors of, of honesty falter, so, so inevitably does truth itself. 
Secondly, and related to this, digital technology has become the all-important primary indispensable engine of this change. Now, in the early years of the online revolution, um, it was optimistically assumed by many, myself included, that the internet would inevitably smooth the path to sustainable global cooperation and pluralism. And, and, and I, I, I still, still think it's worth saluting the achievements it has made. Very unfashionable at the moment, the digital revolution, but it has done ma amazing things. Uh, the trouble is it's also uh, done at least as much to foster, if you like, balkanization and a general retreat into echo chambers. Um, Barack Obama put this very well in his farewell address. He said, and I'm quoting, we become so secure in our bubbles that we start accepting only information, whether it's true or not, that fits our opinions, instead of basing our opinions on the evidence that is out there. So, for all its wonders, the web tends to amplify the shrill and to dismiss complexity. And for many, and perhaps most, it encourages confirmation bias rather than a quest for accurate disclosure. Um, as Eric S. Raymond famously predicted, the cathedral, the old structure, is yielding place to the bazaar. And there are profits to be made from this, the production line of clickbait hoaxes, unscientific medical claims, crackpot theories, fictional sightings of UFOs or Jesus. And the disincentives to publications so far are marginal. The ease of production is enticing. Uh, for those on social media, anonymity dramatically reduces accountability. And the buzz of the hive sends the falsehood fizzing into cyberspace to do its work. Never has the old adage that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its boots seem so timely or, or worrying. So in the consequent cacophony, the flow of information is increasingly dominated by peer-to-peer -peer interaction and recommendation rather than the old-fashioned imprimatur of the traditional media. We consume what we already like and we tend to shy away from the unfamiliar. Uh, so, massive irony, the ultimate generator of novelty has also become the curator par excellence of hearsay, folklore and prejudice. And the really crucial point is that this, this is not a design flaw, this is not an unintended consequence. It's what the algorithms are meant to do. It's what they're designed to do. They're meant to connect us with the things we like or might like. They're fantastically responsive to personal taste and fantastically blind so far to veracity. The web is it's, it's a kind of dream vector for post-truth, precisely because it's indifferent to falsehood, honesty, and the difference between the two. And that's why what we call fake news now, has become such an issue, especially on Facebook. Um, going back to 2016, among the most read hoax stories of that year were the following. The claim that Obama had banned the Pledge of Allegiance in schools. The story that Pope Francis shocks the world, endorses Donald Trump for president, releases statement. A report that Trump was offering free one-way tickets to Africa and Mexico for those who, who want to leave America and ISIS leader calls for American Muslim voters to support Hillary Clinton. Now, you listen, they are, they are funny until you uh, look at some of the research. The, the, as ludicrous as these stories may seem, they, they appear to command a measure of belief. In December last year, an Ipsos poll of more than 3,000 Americans found that 75% of those who saw fake hit news headlines like this judged them to be accurate. So if digital technology is the hardware, post-truth has proved to be an incredibly effective software. It reduces political discourse to a kind of video game in which endless play on multiple levels is the sole point of the exercise. Conspiracy theories, pseudoscience, Holocaust denial, all, as I said, all of them are enjoying a new lease of life and unprecedented circulation. So, before we all slash our wrists and give up the ghost, <laughs> Let me say that the, the reason I wrote the book was because I'm an optimist and I think that, that actually there is a lot that can be done. And, and in conclusion, I'd just like to touch on some of the things that I think can be done to, to, to push back against this. The first and most important uh, thing to recognize is that in any uh, cultural development, uh, political development too actually, there is no pendulum. 
there is no inevitable swing back. I mean, if politics in its volatility has taught us anything in the last few years, it's that things don't just swing back. People don't just get bored of one party or one cultural configuration and, and go back to the old system. That, that, that time, if it indeed it ever existed, is past. So the way to deal with post-truth has to involve action. The first um, uh, kind of subheading of action I would, um, I would note is what I call the scrutiny spectrum, which is a spectrum of activities which range from fact-checking, wonderful uh, growth of fact-checking as a, an industry, really, now, um, that, that, that is, is something that's, that's sprung up in the last 12 months. Um, and it's really in, in, incredible how many terrific um, non-profit, mostly, organizations are really getting to grips with real-time verification. Now, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult task, but it's, it, the speed with which they, these things are happening really gives me um, uh, cheer, full fact, first draft, things like that. And they also, as well as actually testing, the BBC's reality check's another good one, um, as well as testing the claims of, of um, politicians and other uh, public figures, they, they conduct an out post, post facto analyses of campaigns and so on to see what, what was right and what was wrong. And I think this, this is not to be sniffed at. Um, at the other slightly more extreme end of the scrutiny spectrum, there is litigation and there have been cases in Germany and France of people who've said enough and have taken tech giants to court. And I think that in cases that is necessary and it has a, a cultural ripple effect. Um, above all, I think that we need unambiguously, and the RSA is a fantastic place to, to talk about this, to, um, to say that digital literacy should be a compulsory subject from primary school upwards. Uh, that teaching children how to handle the web is, is at least as important as teaching them how to read and understand um, traditional texts. Uh, they're not just going to be citizen journalists, they're going to be citizen editors. They're going to have to learn new skills of discernment and evaluation. And I think we're in the foothills of that, but it is incredibly important. Um, at the other end, uh, leaving the scrutiny spectrum aside, you have the tech giants themselves. Now, it's no accident that since what happened in 2016, Facebook, Google, Apple, and the others have all suddenly shown an interest in behaving well. Um, because uh, before then, there was, an, there was a kind of collective arrogance about these, these companies, which was, which was born of a combination of enthusiasm for what they could offer and ignorance about how they actually worked. And as people are starting to realize that, that in fact they're not free services at all, we give them their attention and they sell it, um, that there's an equal understanding that there are responsibilities that come with their power. And my hope is that they will self-regulate because I think that's always preferable to government regulation. But it is a fact that just to take Europe Britain, France, and Germany are all looking very hard at what they will do if the tech giants don't sort their act out. Now, uh, regulating global companies is, an, is, is a business of immense complexity. And uh, again, we are, this, is a, this is a very germinal movement. But I think that the days when the tech giants could just simply claim total impunity and uh, particularly propagate the myth that they were platforms and not publishers are over and they will have to come to the table. And the, the best thing really would be if they all went to a table themselves and negotiated a global convention on how to handle the, 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 the whole issue of what they publish, how they deal with fake stories, what sanctions they impose. Um, at the moment, the sort of flagging off of, up of contested data simply isn't enough. But the, they, they certainly have the technological capacity to do uh, whole lot more than they, they, they're doing at the moment. And, and funnily enough, there's some fascinating work being done on AI and its ability to, uh, to analyze what is true and what isn't. Very early days there again. But when the tech giant says there's nothing to do with us, which they still occasionally do, don't believe them. Um, the final, uh, final couple of points. Um, facts aren't enough. Uh, Post-truth will not tumble 
under the bombardment of more and more and more data. It, it, we, we now have a, a duty as supporters of liberal democracy to communicate facts in a way that recognises emotional as well as rational imperatives. And that, this is a very, very difficult task. Um, to take a micro example, there's a new technique called motivation interview, which a lot of doctors are using. And, and the reason that it works is because instead of just the doctor saying to the patient, you're ill, shut up, this is the treatment, the doctor takes the, the patient through a series of very um, uh, emotionally intelligent questions about their behavior, about their needs, and about what lies ahead. And it's been shown to work dramatically better as a way of taking patients through the process that lies ahead of them if they have not just serious illnesses, but any form of illnesses. It's a complete reconfiguration of the old expert versus consumer model that, that has dominated medicine. And I think it's an interesting model for how other um, uh, areas of, of communication might work. Politicians, for example, really do need to align factual claims with emotional significance. You know, obviously, they shouldn't sacrifice veracity to theatricality. That would be a disaster. But we've seen uh, examples. I mean, my own particular favourite was when Theresa May was asked about nurses being forced to go to food banks. And instead of even mentioning the, the, the appalling nature of that, she started to spout statistics about the NHS. Now that, that, is, that is not good enough and it's also uh, fantastically counterproductive and it and degrades the political process. The, the politicians of the future uh, need to recognize the adulthood of the voters and not infantilize them with a kind of machine gun spray of data it's very, very important that, that, that you, you, you come out and you stretch out a hand to the person making the objection, but in taking the hand, you speak to them as if they were grown-ups uh, and not just saying, don't worry your pretty little head about it, we're, we're, we've ring-fenced the NHS, um, next question. The, there, there is a debasement of political discourse which I think is, is really alarming and it needs, um, it needs to be addressed in, in, in a communal and collaborative way. Um, it, it always strikes me, and one thing I always mention is, can you imagine any politician in the developed world, indeed anywhere, giving Kennedy's inaugural first, his inaugural address? You know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I mean, that, no politician would do that because it wouldn't get past the focus group. And we need to return to, uh, an honesty in discourse where, where politicians are prepared to, to make demands of the public as well as to, uh, sp to speak the truth about their own failures. And this, the, it, when one says that, it sounds so obvious, but actually it is completely at odds with contemporary political practice. Um, we've ended up with a, with a kind of uh, bogus, bastardized rhetoric where unattainable promises are matched by unreasonable expectations, and the gap between rhetoric and reality only compounds the disenchantment and the distrust. My final thought I want to leave you is, is, with is this, which is um, we have to do this ourselves. Um, it's, it's very important that this be a collaborative enterprise, and if necessary, an insurgent one. I wrote the book as a call to arms because I believe profoundly that truth is discovered, not distributed. We, if we wait for uh, people in charge of corporations or politicians to do this for us, it won't happen. We have, to, we have to demand the truth. We have to speak out and raise our voices because passivity is not a neutral act. It, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's in fact a decision to allow the status quo to prevail and that in this instance is, is, is not acceptable. My, uh, my, my favorite political quotation of all time is, is, is of Benjamin Franklin being accosted when he emerged from Independence Hall in 1787 after the second drafting and being uh, asked by a, a woman, so Mr. Franklin, what, 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 what manner of government have you bequeathed us? And Franklin turned to her and said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And I think that if you can keep it, 
is the absolute core of uh, democratic politics, because the point Franklin was making was you're going to get your republic, but the forces of tyranny will conspire against you forever, and you have to keep that republic healthy. And in the broadest possible sense, of course, we live in a constitutional monarchy, not a republic, but in, 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 the, in the Plato sense of republic, we are all defenders of the republic. So my hope is that the post-truth will face an army of, of people who are not happy and not content with it, and they're determined to keep the republic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. So I'd like to start by um, drilling down, as they say, um, into the, the sort of newness of, of these phenomena, um, because I think it's a funny way in which um, the internet sort of gets rid of history, that we just live in this permanent present and actually we can't see the his historical context of the moment we're at. And only, as you say, by understanding what's new um, can we start to, to diagnose the problems and try and cu um, cure them. Um, but, um, so, but I would like to talk a bit more about social media because, um, you know, I mean, you, obviously you, you talk about it in the book and you mentioned it there, but I'm wondering if we're a little bit too easy on it in the sense that, um, you know, as you acknowledge in the book, the advertising um, uh, model means that there's financial incentives towards clicks rather than truth, um, which, you know, if you have a, a decline of the pay journalism model, um, then the incentives um, are, are um, against truth. Um, and in, in addition, as, the, as you also mentioned, there are um, much easier ways to manipulate data, as we're seeing in the journalism by Carol Cadwallader, um, you know, these shady data firms, you know, which are, sound like conspiracies but seem to be true, the manipulation of the data by these powerful commercial and political forces. So, and we're also seeing these very vocal attacks on on elites, the liberal elites, on experts, you know, which I think is, very, is a very toxic alignment of these attacks on elites and the kind of supposed interests of ordinary people. So it's almost as if journalists, um, newspapers have power. Um, and, you know, chance would be a fine thing, frankly. So, um, so I wonder, you know, what you think about um, these attacks on sort of supposed gatekeepers and experts and, you know, um, upholders of the truth. Um, and the rise of this commercialised um, internet, um, social media landscape. Well, it's, it's such a good point, and, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned Carol uh, journalism. If you haven't seen it, do Google it uh, when, you, when you get home, because Carol Cadwaddle has, uh, has done an amazing series of articles about the extent to which uh, big data was scraped off social media in the last referendum by apparently by a company called Cambridge Analytica, which was associated with at least and possibly owned by a very shady and shadowy figure called Robert Mercer, who in turn turns out to be a great friend of Steve Bannon and, a, and one of the main uh, funders of, of Donald Trump. You're seeing a pattern here emerge, I suspect. Um, and yes, I mean, what... what the thing, about the, the thing about digital technology is it, 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 we, we have moved from the gold rush to um, the establishment of Las Vegas in about four years. Um, the initial phase was so exciting and so energizing, and, and yet suddenly there are five fortress-like tech giants which control almost all the information in the world. I mean, no, no companies ever, no, no, no nations, no forces, um, has ever controlled as much uh, information about us as they do. Um, they scrape data from our, uh, our, our, our pages and our feeds about our tastes, about who we are, uh, about what we, what we want and what we do uh, with extraordinary um, vigor and skill, and they sell it. And then they're able to uh, target information at uh, people with in an entirely bespoke way. Um, now, this is at the very least a defamation, deformation, deformation of the democratic process because no one really knows about it. Um, take a very um, kind of parochial example: the, the, the rules governing 
the law governing this in this country, the 2000 Act, is just now totally out of date and it needs to be um, ripped up and started again because the way in which data is used is, is so fundamental to voting behaviour. There's, there's, there's a lot of, um, I mean, I, again, it's such early days, but I've been fascinated by the number of Tories who've uh, told me since the election that one of the ways they lost was that their use of social media was so much worse than Labour's, which really surprised them. Now, that doesn't mean that Labour's use of social media was improper. Um, what I'm saying is that, that these, these strategies uh, can quite easily shift, shift power. Um, and we're not, we're, there is almost no transparency about them at all. The ads that are fired into our political ads that are fired into our Facebook pages are not uh, publicly available, mm. unlike posters and so on. Yeah. And on the subject of power, I mean, another aspect of the newness is, as you say, this tolerance of truth amongst the public. Um, and, you know, there's, it's, towards ever thus arguments are problematic because they do obscure the, the rise of these new forms of power. And do you not think that um, there's also been a change in terms of political accountability that, um, that, that there used to be, you know, the, such thing as a resignable offence? And so there was an ability to track political statements over time, you know, to say, you said that, this, then, then you say that now. Um, it seems like we're losing the ability to, to hold leaders to account over time, and that's obviously a to do with the de decline of the journalistic record, and also the de decline of a powerful political opposition. Um, but isn't it also to do with, you know, the Iraq war and the, um, the ability of... Um, political leaders to simply say, look, you know, there was misinformation, but actually I can still hold on to power. Um, it just doesn't matter. So it's actually about not so much um, a tolerance of truth amongst the public, but um, a, a, re a resignation um, to the seeming reality that yes. the exercise of power can shape reality um, according to its own desires. Well, exactly. And, and also because, as it were, political voice used to be identifiable. You would see it in Parliament or in uh, the newspapers or on television or whatever. But now it, the, 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 the forces that, that spread political messages might be bots operating across social media in a way that you, you don't know at all. So th there's that, there's, there's a lack of transparency. But I, I think you're absolutely right. And I'm, I mentioned the decline of trust. I think that the, uh, the, the political class in this country has absolutely failed to address this problem of trust. And it has failed to develop a language that acknowledges just how shredded trust in the political class is. And I spend a lot of my time writing about politics and I'm genuinely amazed by how little change there's been in, in, in the way politicians talk. Early Obama was kind of the only exception to that. Early Obama had a kind of uh, eloquence and humility about it, which was very interesting. But we're back to the verbalist sentences. I mean, I think strong and stable was, um, <laughs> it, it was kind of um, the nadir of the whole thing. The, the idea that a public that has been through the kind of processes you mentioned would respond to kind of, you know, really clunky neuro-linguistic programming um, is, is, is insulting. Um, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in, um, humili in political humility. I think that people respond very well to it. Um, I'll never forget um, interviewing Mike Portillo on the morning after he uh, lost his seat in 1997. And he was undoubtedly at that point, on the night of 1997 when he lost his seat, he was the most hated uh, uh, politician in the country. But in the interview he did with me, he spoke with huge dignity and humility about he'd got it wrong, he understood that he'd made massive mistakes, the party had to change, he had to change. And I got a huge mailbag about it, because this was in, before emails, which is slightly embarrassing to admit. Um, the, I mean, emails existed, but people didn't use them very much. And more to the point, he did too. And uh, I had a kind of little, you know, one of those terrible hope moments where you think, ah, there's going to be a change, and then things 
carry on as normal. Um, but I, I, really, I really do think that the, the political class, I mean, what we're seeing at the moment going on in Westminster is the absolute, I mean, if you wanted to kind of dramatize the worst possible impression uh, of, 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 of what a, a, a governing uh, party should do, that's it, which is, there's, there's an election and, you, and what do you do? You say, nothing has changed and we're going to align ourselves with, a, a, with an unlovely minority party in order to stay in power. That, go on. Could you not turn that on its head and actually say the problem that we have is, along with the decline of the authority of experts and you know, upholders of rationality and knowledge, we also have attacks on politicians and actually the, the gods now are the corporate and financial forces and actually shouldn't politicians have more authority? Which kind yeah. of brings us on to the question of what is truth? I mean, I, I think there's an interesting question around ideology and rhetoric because rhetoric gets a, a bad press you know politicians who are ideological they get a bad press you know it's only the other side who are ideological we're simply doing what works and actually isn't it the case that rather than truth and lies what we need is a sort of sincere ideology um, from our politicians they should sort of stand up and be proud and assert their position and be confident of their ideological position rather than being sort of humble technocrats yes, just saying I, we're just I, doing I, what I, works i couldn't agree more i think honesty is strength uh, and um i don't think that ideology or rhetoric necessarily uh, corrodes truth at all i think that often it's 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 its vehicle uh, not invariably of course but but i i i'm you know, I find appealing your idea of, of, of politicians seizing the moment and, and, and saying, um, I mean, it would be wonderful to have a politician who said, isn't it kind of strange that the world is now dominated by five big companies and what are we going to do about it? I, I'm not hugely optimistic about that happening in the near future, but I think it will happen, actually. Um, I am an optimist and I do think, I, I, look, at, I look at the young... Um, I'm a father of two teenagers, and I look at them, and I, and, and, and I see the youth vote in this election, and I think the next generation actually is terrific. I really do. And I get very annoyed when people sort of uh, roll out the, the standard complaints about millennials, because I think you know, they have a much harder time than certainly my generation did. Um, and I think that they, they won't put up with it. Now, whether we can wait that long is a, is a, is a separate question, but I absolutely agree with you. I think politicians uh, need to reclaim their, their position. And, and, and the corollary of that, which is, was implicit in your, your question, is we need, we need to give them the space to do it. Because one of the difficulties of the current um, kind of the, the, the rules of the game, if you like, is that we, we hate all politicians with a couple of exceptions. You know, some people get a pass, but not many. Um, we have to make a collective decision about whether we want our representatives to, to be uh, our representatives and for their lives to be possible because I'm um, of an age where I'm watching uh, some of the best people of my generation leave politics because they cannot stand it any longer. Now, I'm not asking for them a great wave of sympathy for them. It's more enlightened self-interest. We don't want the good people to leave. We really don't. Uh, particularly women, actually. I, I think, you know, some of the, some of the I think one, one of my great heroines is Stella Creasy. Um, the way that she stood up on social media to the, these absolutely disgusting attacks is, is, is really admirable. But, but not everyone has her kind of strength. And I think that what, what's concerning is a generation of people coming through who might just not want that to happen. Yeah. And one more question before I turn over to you. And I suppose I felt you were a little bit hard on postmodernism in your book, um, in the sense that, you know, to me, those, the, the critics that you, that you discuss, you know, obviously Marx, Adorno, Baudrillard, you know, they were critics of, you know, the ideology critique. They were denouncing the very kind of post-truth phenomena that we see now. And, and also, I suppose, what, the way I see postmodernism, we don't want to go too far down that road, but it was about the construction of truth. It wasn't about, you know, there's a difference between saying that truth is constructed through these ecosystems of verification, authority, and academic consensus, and so on, and, and relativism, on the other hand. And actually, 
you know, it's, isn't it important in terms of teaching the young to, to invest in these kind of institutions of authority that have, you know, scientific yep. methods and so on? How do we get to the truth? And th those, and to my mind, it's those delicate ecosystems of authority and, and verification and truth that are being hollowed out. I think it's interesting that uh, without getting into a, a long debate about postmodernism, which is normally clears a room, um, uh, it, it's funnily enough, it's been one of the, to my great surprise, it's been one of the most controversial chapters in the book. Um, just in sum, all I was really trying to say in that chapter um, was that I think that the, uh, some of the aspects of postmodernism have seeped beyond the walls of the academy into a kind of uh, pernicious relativism. Uh, I think you can, ha you can indeed have a very interesting debate about you know, what these thinkers were trying to achieve. And, and, and I do say in the, in, in the book that I think some of the things they achieved were, were, were excellent. But, I, what, and I'm certain, also by the way, I'm not implying that Donald Trump sits up at night reading Baudrillard, because I think that's it's slightly implausible. But <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but but I, I, I do, what I do think is, is the case is that, um, there is a difference between pluralism and relativism. All I was really trying to say in that chapter was there's a difference between pluralism and relativism, and we are dangerously close to the latter. Yes, that theory has been turned to ill. Yes, yes exactly. So, questions. questions. Uh, I'd like to take three questions, and then we'll. So, gentlemen over here in the front row with a check shirt. My, my question is around. Isn't there fundamentally the issue of the commercialization of the news? Everything is now up for sale. All the state assets now are privatized. You can't walk down the street with yet another poster sign, display board. Hasn't the news just simply gone down the same route? And the issue is the absence of a sustainable economic model for, if you like, non-commercial news, because isn't that the vehicle by which, I mean, you look at The Guardian right now, they keep begging people to help keep them alive. There's not a model by which, unless you take it at source from the license fee, uh, to do that. And if you go to the US, obviously it's the extreme polarized model, Fox versus others. Yeah, okay. Gentleman over here on the left, yeah. Thank you. I look forward to reading your book, but in the meantime, I was checking the FT online. There's an article of 10 hours ago about Cambridge Analytica having spent six and a half million pounds in one billion micro-targeted ads in Facebook for the latest campaign of Brexit. Now, nobody's going to check the veracity of any of these ads, but if I put an ad in Facebook and it's false, I get done for false advertisement. So is the problem of the echo chambers that they are repeating falsehoods or the problem that they exist to begin with? Okay, and then there was one at the back here. Um, thank you. Um, uh, it's a question about in, in international institutions. Um, I, I travelled around the West Bank in Israel recently, and that's a place where the truth is bitterly contested. Um, yet the response of international institutions, you know, in the face of illegality or stifling of debate or whatever, whether it's Trump or Israel, it seems very ineffective. So do we, re do we need to rethink, reinvent some of these, uh, whether it's the UN, whatever, these international responses to the post-truth world? Uh, well, if I could start um, with the last question, which is, 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 is a very interesting one. Um, I, yes, I, gr I completely agree. And funnily enough, I was at the OECD uh, the week before last, which is just rather, rather intriguingly taking on this whole agenda in a very proactive way. Um, and I hope other inter uh, international institutions follow its lead. Um, there's, there's a kind of a default position in the post-war international uh, institutional order that um, you don't get involved in, in, in that kind of um, the nitty gritty of this kind of debate. But the OECD, partly in response to Brexit, I think, uh, f feels that it's, it, it's important now to actually go out and start making a fuss. And I'm delighted by that because they have the resources, they have the quality of people to do it. Um, you know, think, think what would be achieved if, if the UN undertook a similar undertaking. Uh, it would be terrific. Um, so, so uh, a, a hearty yes to that. Um, Cambridge Analytica, well, uh, you know, you took the words out of my mouth. Uh, I mean, the, the question about what um, you can put as an advert on uh, uh, social media is, uh, sounds 
very kind of prosaic, but actually it's at the, it's the heart of this. And um, The Guardian actually did a, a, a whole series of articles on Facebook's community standards, which are, you know, fantastically uh, wishy-washy and clearly aimed at maximizing revenue. Um, and I don't think that settlement can, can survive. And I think that the, the outing of uh, Cambridge Analytica and other companies uh, is the start of, of a rolling back of that. We, we, but we have to we have to be it comes down to my last point. we we have to keep up the pressure i mean there's a there's a uh, select committee inquiry into fake news at the moment which is looking at the tech giants um, there are there is a information commission and an electoral commission inquiry into the referendum but those are just nap bites i mean they're, they're all excellent but we, we need more than that i mean it's clear to me that we need uh, con a continued pressure. Um, I, 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 people always end up, we need a Royal Commission. Um, <laughs> there's, there's something fantastically pompous about saying that, so I'm not going to say it. Um, but, but we do need, we really do need a relentless, uh, uh, you know, a spotlight to be shone on this. And it can't just be, this is, this is part of the thing. There's a kind of uh, a panicked oscillation to politics at the moment, which is something bad happens, we worry about it for 10 minutes, and then we move on to breakfast. Um, this is a long haul, because we're dealing with, with a, uh, uh, an industrial revolution of, of, of extraordinary proportions, and we're barely, we're, we're barely finding out what the right questions are yet, uh, let alone the answers. So, you know, we, this, is, this, this needs total commitment, and it needs networks and organizations that are prepared to work for 10 years, not 10 days, but, but, it's a re but it's a really good point. On the question of um, the, uh, the, the kind of economic models of um, uh, the commercialization of news and uh, how, how, to, how to proceed, well, look, um, there, there has always been, well, in, in modern history anyway, public, public service broadcasting, public sector broadcasting, principally the BBC, and then the, the private sector companies and there's been a long and uh, bitter debate about how who owns and how accountable they should be and all that sort of thing I think the debate is now morphing into uh, something ev even more uh, alarming which is uh, yes you've got one terrific institution that has a for now 11 years of stable funding and thank God we have it and I'm interested when I travel around the world how people say to me thank God we've got the BBC the bigger question is how the much, the much maligned MSM media brands are going to find a sustainable uh, economic model of any sort in the future, let alone all the other um, brands that we need. I, I think that we haven't really landed anywhere close to finding a means of monetizing um, uh, good investigative journalism, what, what the BBC calls slow journalism. It's easy to do clickbait. I mean, that you can generate money easily. What's harder is how do you, how do you raise the money you need to fund the next Woodward and Bernsteins? Because investigative journalism, I'm here to tell you, mostly fails. 90% of investigative journalism leads to nothing. So how do you, how do you build a business model where in order to get that 10% of gold, you're willing to put up with 90% of dross. It is so countercultural at the moment. Um, people talk about crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. That may be a way forward. But I think um, it, it, David Frum on the morning after the, um, the conservative thinker, who uh, I, I think is often right about stuff, um, on the morning after Trump's election was asked on a talk show, what should we do? You know, what, you know, how can we... How can we help? And he said, take out a subscription to a newspaper. And I thought that was a terrific answer. Yeah. Okay, questions on this side. So the lady here in the, sh in the blue shirt. Um, thank you. Um, you talked about visual literacy being essentially essential from infancy up. Um, I've got a five-year-old granddaughter who's going to be much sa more savvy in this field than I am very shortly. Um, and I wondered if you'd talk a little bit more about um, how you see that happening 
at an institutional level quite clearly, but maybe also just at the personal level. Uh, Lady at the front. Thank you. Um, I've got one from our um, live tweeters, if that's okay, from Nico McDonald. Um, he says, uh, you say that digital tech has become the engine of change, and um, in what sense does technology kind of have agency over us, and I suppose what are the implications for our ability to kind of control the spread of fake news? Okay. Gentleman over there in the glasses. You mentioned uh, digital literacy, but isn't that slightly missing the point, not going back far enough? If anyone has looked at climate change, no, it's actually scientific literacy, which gives us the basis of how we determine what is true. There's now a new school of philosophy, I think I've got it right, called agnotology, which studies basically the creation of falsehoods. So things like words like false equivalence, cognitive dissonance, these have been obscuring the political discourse for decades now, cherry picking, there is so, there's been so many falsehoods in climate science that we've now been set back to the point where you know, it may no longer be the case where the solutions we've got will actually be applicable, so we've always got to go back to the drawing board. So what do you have to think about scientific literacy? Okay, and I'll add one final question. Oh, hello, yeah. You mentioned uh, five organisations um, that sort of control information. I'm just wondering, what's the uh, danger of the five becoming three, two, one? And I wonder if you could also list the five, because it'd be, you know, I've got an idea who you might mean, but it'd be quite interesting to, 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 to list the five. Okay, well, um, starting from the top, the uh, digital literacy question, which uh, is, is a fascinating one. Um, your five-year-old granddaughter knows more than you do, probably, I'm guessing, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, because you know, I find that there's a, there's a lot of ageism in this, which just seems that people you know, don't know uh, how to handle technical stuff. But let's take the stereotype, because you raise it yourself. Um, she knows how to handle the devices better than you do, but she doesn't know necessarily what, what, how to handle what comes out of it. And I think that, that the, the task, and it's not, an easy, it's not as easy as it sounds, because we're going through a transitional period where the people who will be teaching children are still of an age where they think the internet is something new and groovy, where the, the, your, grand, your granddaughter regards the internet as all around her, and, and, and once the internet of things and, and you know, um, Alexa and all these uh, boxes in our rooms are, 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 are developed into things which literally run our houses. The, the notion, the word digital, will probably drop out of use. So, what, what I'm talking about, as a just a first basic step, is that people be, the kids be taught how to um, be wary of what comes on their screens. I mean, I, I mentioned in the book that that I, I did a Google search on the Holocaust and truth, and four of the ten searches that came back were uh, Holocaust denial sites. So, it, you know, just to take that example, uh, it needs to be taught to children from a very early age that Google is not an Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, it, if you go do a Google search, you may, what you'll get is things that, that are linked to your, to, to your search and other people's searches, but it doesn't, it doesn't guarantee veracity. Um, and that links in, I hope, that, that, that by, by the stage your granddaughter is 10, that there'll be a lot more kite marking. You know, this, this, this site is kite marked by the following recognized fact-checking organizations as, as reliable on a scale of one to 10, that kind of thing. But at the moment, there's really none of that at all. And I, I think it's a kind of urgent civic task. To link that into what the gentleman said about um, scientific literacy, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, the, please, don't, please don't imagine that I was saying one or the other. Um, and indeed, I, I love that phrase Kingsley Amos used to use about pernicious neutrality, which is that um, in, there's a huge pressure uh, in, in the media now to, to just have a row. So you have one person representing um, climate change science, in other words, 99.5% of scientists, and then someone who represents a load of old nonsense, mm -hmm. and they go at it for 10 minutes, and that's it. And obviously, that's irresponsible journalism, uh, and, it, and it needs to be 
fought back in schools, and um, that's what, I mean, a total aside, but one of the reasons that I'm not entirely happy about the DUP deal is because I suspect that they'll want to get their hands on the education system, but anyway, that's by the by. Um, the, uh, the question of um, the power, the, the, the treated question of the power that technology has over us is, is extremely important. Um, the the danger with technology is 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 keeping is is a human agency keeping pace with technological innovation, and that has that is not a new problem. That is a problem that has uh, been innate to human uh, innovation, and this is a big one because we need to uh, we, we need to be very well we, we need to be very aware that the pace of change here is greater than it has ever been, and therefore keeping ahead of of uh, technology and making sure that we are the masters of it rather than the other way around is, I think, the greatest cultural challenge of our times. And I don't, I minimize that at all. The five, well, they, it, it depends who you ask. I mean, uh, I would say Apple, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and, you know, uh, probably Snapchat or a and other. I mean, there are people might differ on that, but there, 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 there are five. There are usually five. Some people list seven, but they are. Um, the, 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 the question you raised first is what if they become one, two, or three? Is a really good question. And uh, Amazon, Amazon, I suppose, is the other one. Um, it, it, you know, keep, that is a, that, no one has asked that before, and it's a really good question. What do you do when Jeff Bezos decides to buy Apple? <laughs> and uh, do, do, does antitrust le legislation in the states cover it? I don't know. But maybe th there's a great uh, constitutional historian called Philip Bobbitt who, who says that it's very important to have preemptive legislation. That legislation is like vaccination. You need to do it before it happens rather than after. And I would say this is a good example of Bobbitt legislation, that we need to pass laws that ensure that the tech giants cannot amalgamate because then you really would be looking at kind of uh, science fiction dystopias, wouldn't you? Yes. Well, that, 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 you see, that's a, that's a glorious image, but the trouble is, we all bloody use them, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, after I leave this, I will go and tweet how much I enjoyed it and what a brilliant audience you all were, right? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> go figure. So, I suppose the closing question might be, is digital disengagement still an option? So I'll leave you with that because we are sadly out of time. Um, copies of Matthew's book uh, are available in the foyer and he, I'm sure he's happy sure. to sign them for you. Um, but um, before you do that, please join me in thanking our brilliantly thought-provoking speaker, Matthew Dancona. Thank